Hey everybody out there, here's Cornelius Jones coming to you. We are about to continue our Revelation series and let's get into this next installment. Guys, I'm just ready to just pick up the pace here with this Revelation series and so I hope you are ready to dig into God's Word. Listen, I mean, what else is there to say about Revelation 12? <laughs> you know, I mean, we have been studying Revelation 12 for months now, and there's just been so much that has already been talked about as it relates to Revelation 12. However, I do have a few more nuggets for you today. I believe there are some details in this chapter that still need to be brought out and discussed, and so I am looking forward to this. Let's go ahead and jump into the next installment, Revelation chapter 12. Here we go. So it starts off Verse one, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. And so right away, this is the very popular verse uh, that I believe that uh, Scott Clark uh, discovered the signs in the heavens with the constellation Virgo. And yes, this prophecy was fulfilled. I can say very confidently on September 23rd of this year, 2017. There was a constellation in the sky called Virgo. On this day, the sun was clothed on her, the moon was under her feet, and there was a garland of 12 stars above her head. Normally, the constellation Leo is above her head, which is made up of nine stars, but on this particular day, Leo was joined with Mercury, Mars, and Venus to form the 12 stars. And we all know in the Hebrew language, they call the planets running stars. Now, I'm not going to go so deep into that because we have spent so much time on Revelation 12 and those things. I believe if you're one of my followers, if you've been following this, you already understand that. Okay. But what I want to reiterate here well, if you are new to this, then, you know, there are plenty of other videos that you can go back and look at. OK, but what I want to point out here is just reiterate that this was a great sign, the Bible says. OK, and so what we're understanding now is that when you look at a sign, a sign is a warning of something to come. OK, many of us, myself included, of course, we were believing that the rapture could possibly happen on September 23rd. OK, but obviously that did not happen. But understand, though, this was a great sign. And so we cannot take that lightly that God provided us a great sign. And as we get further into this text, you will understand clearer if you haven't understood already why I believe this sign was talking about the rapture. OK, now there are many other things we're going to get into with this chapter, but I do need have to point out some brief things real quickly. There are a lot of people out there that was very uncomfortable with looking at this interpretation. They didn't even want to consider it as a possibility because they believed we should not be doing astrology. OK, well, what I want to point out here very carefully and very clearly is that there is a major, major, major difference between astrology, which is demonic and astronomy, which is of God. OK, astrology, you see, Satan always takes what God made good, what God made perfect, and he distorts it. We see that Satan wants to take what God made. He wants to pervert it and turn it around and use it for his own evil purposes. You see, that's what Satan did with astronomy. Astronomy is simply the study of the stars and the planets. That's all it is. It is God who put the planets in their place. It is God who put the stars in their place. The Bible says that God is the one who knows the stars all by name. God and not one is missing. Genesis 1:14 says that God made the stars for seasons and that word is appointed times in the Hebrew, okay? God made the stars for signs and appointed times. That's what God said. In Luke chapter 21, verse 26, or maybe it's verse 25, 
It says that there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. So you have to understand it is nothing unbiblical about looking at the signs that God has put in the heavens. And that is, that is the star dealing with the stars, dealing with the planets, dealing with the sun, dealing with the moon. So when you have that understanding, then you know this is astronomy. Okay, astrology is what Satan did. Astrology, Satan took the constellations and the stars that God named and he turned it into idol worship. Satan wants you to look at the, the constellations for biblical, excuse me, not for biblical. He wants you to look at them for advice on how to live your life. Well, that's that's idolatry because we're not supposed to look to the stars for advice on what decisions and choices we should make based on the calendar that we were born, the month that we were born. That's We go to the Holy Father for that. We go to the Holy Spirit for that. We go to the scripture for that. Satan has turned people away from seeking Christ. Instead, they are seeking the stars for guidance on the decisions that they should make in their life. That is called astrology. We do not practice astrology. That does not take away from, however, biblical astronomy, which is the study of the things, the planets in this case, that God created. The stars and planets that God created, which he says clearly in his word, he created them for signs. Okay, signs of what? the signs of the soonness of his coming, okay? So that was very important. I wanted to put that out there. Very different thing, astrology versus astronomy. If you don't understand the difference, then you'll be missing out on some great signs that God has put in scripture for us to look at, okay? Now, let's continue to read. Verse three, it says, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Now, another thing I'm realizing here, this entire text here, I thought and many others thought that this would all happen on the same day. OK, but what, what I'm coming to realize here that different the different parts in this text don't necessarily have to happen on the same day. Verse one happened on September 23rd. OK. Now, verse when we get at verse three, it says another sign. You see, so it's not necessarily the same sign as Revelation 12, 1. It says another sign appeared in heaven, this great fiery red dragon. Now, there has been a lot of speculation about what this dragon could be. I still believe that this dragon is this planet called Planet X. Uh, I'm not dogmatic about it, though, but that is what I uh, believe. How Planet X could have seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. That could be, you know, the, the moons that is surrounded by Planet X. And then Planet X has a tail with all the, you know, the, uh, the debris that is in the gravitational pull behind it. And so I see how that could possibly be uh, the sign that could appear here. Okay. Now, uh, there are others that speculate this, you know, the... Uh, the, in the constellation that forms that snake looking figure at the feet of Virgo, that that could be the dragon. Uh, I don't see how that could be a dragon because that constellation is always there. It has always been there. And, but this verse says it is a great sign that appeared. So how can that be the great sign if it's always there? It's, it's you know, that doesn't make sense to me. Like the sign in verse one, this constellation has always been there, but the placement of the sun, the moon, and the stars over her head have not always been there. And so it is a very rare sign. Don't let anybody tell you that Revelation 12, 1 happened before. It never happened before specifically. You may have had some parts of it, but not all the parts together like they were on September 23rd, completely matching the description here in this verse. OK, so if it's a great sign, it can't be something that has always been there. So let's go to verse four. It says his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it as it was born. So here we see here there is some type of collision with the with the tail of this dragon and other stars. And these stars are coming to the earth. Well, I think that fits perfectly with the speculation that Planet X crashes into Jupiter 
or in its tail, it is it's causing this collision and all these asteroids, comets, whatever you call it, and particles are falling to the earth. I, I see that could possibly very well be a possibility. Okay, again, this is not something I'm dogmatic on. This is something that I believe is true. And definitely I could be wrong. Okay. Now, what I want to get into here now is this child. Okay. What we see clearly, the sign is a representation of something physical that is happening on the earth. A sign is something that is telling us or foretelling us or warning us of something that is to come. That is what's important to understand here. These great signs all have meaning, literal meaning, and how they will be fulfilled on the earth. So there is some type of danger about to happen to this child as soon as it is about to be born. Verse 5 says, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Now, growing up, I always looked at this verse and, and, and interpreted that this child was talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? And you see here in verse 5, it says clearly that she bore a male child who was to rule our nations. Now, the she is Israel, okay? Christ did come out of Israel, and we know clearly that Christ will be ruling all nations with a rod of iron, okay? Now, as it relates to the rest of this prophecy, what I'm realizing now is that the rest of it does not fit what happened with Jesus Christ, okay? So let's, let's look into this. The first thing I want to point out is when Christ was born, okay, he was not immediately caught up to God's throne. He lived for 33 years and then he was not caught up. The word caught up is the word harpazo in the Greek, which means to snatch away quickly, suddenly and violently. And it's usually in the reference in the um in the uh, it's uh, excuse me with the reference of being protected from harm, so there's a snatching because and the subject that you are snatching the purpose of the snatching is to keep them out of harm's way. Look this word up yourself, and you will see that is the context with the word harpazo. Well, when Christ ascended, there was no harm. Now, yes, there was harm when he was a baby. Herod was trying to kill him, but Mary and Joseph moved. And he was safe. He was not harpazo to the throne to be kept out of hard's way. So that does not fit Jesus. What happened would actually happen with Jesus Christ. Now, what I would like to suppose, well, we've already supposed this in, in past teachings, but for anyone that may be new to this teaching, what we see here, what is very interesting, this word child in this text is the Greek word technon. It's the Greek word technon, that is 5043 in Strong's Concordance. Technon is a word that means male or female. And when you look all throughout the New Testament, that word was used over and over and over in reference to the children of God or the church. Okay? So when you look things up in the Greek, you understand that this child is not solely talking about Jesus Christ, because in a way it is, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. But what is in view here in this text is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. He is the first fruits of many brethren. His birth happened already. And more specifically, his birth into a glorified, with a glorified body. The resurrection is what I'm talking about. That happened. He's the first fruits of many brethren. So Christ, the head, was born first. Now Christ's body is still waiting to be born. Well, who is the body? We are the body. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And so you see here in verse five, it says, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to the throne of God. How do you explain that the church is going to rule all nations? That can be explained very easily when we turn over to Revelation chapter 2 and we read verse 26. Jesus says, 
And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels. So this is a prophecy straight from the book of Isaiah, I believe, where Christ is, has this rod of iron, which means authority and dominion. And here we see that Christ gives this rod of iron to the church. That is very clear there. In the millennial reign, we will rule with Christ. The rod that Christ has is the same rod that he gives to the church. So what is in line, what is in view here in this verse in chapter 12, verse 5, is the body of Christ being born. You see, we have already been born again of the spirit, but we have not yet been born of physically, okay? There will be a physical birth physically when we receive our glorified bodies. That is a birth, okay? Right now, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're, you have been born again of the spirit. That means there is a new nature that lives inside of you. But this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We must put this immortality, excuse me, this mortality must put on immortality. That is a birth that happens at the resurrection of the dead and at the rapture of the church. Okay, so that is very clear to understand right there. So this child is the body of Christ. When you look at this prophecy, Okay, there are a few reasons that why this cannot just solely be talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, one of the reasons I want to point out is the a prophecy is about foretelling the future and not looking back on the past. Revelation was written in AD 95. Christ resurrected from the dead in AD 33. Okay, so this a prophecy is about future events. So it could not solely just be talking about Christ. OK, uh, another thing that does not fit. I already, I already said that Christ was not her pot sold to the throne. He as a child, he gently ascended. But he was he had a 30. He had a ministry of 33 years. This text said as soon as the child was born, it was snatched up to the throne. That did that does not fit what happened to Christ. Christ lived for 33 years and had a ministry before he ascended gently to heaven. OK, he was not snatched to keep for, to, uh, to be kept from some type of harm. So that does not fit the, uh, what happened with Jesus Christ as well. OK, so when you look at that, this is a more fit description of what is going to happen to the church. OK, the church is being caught up to the throne of God. And again, when you look at what the word child means that was written here, technon, you see all throughout the New Testament, that word was used for the body of Christ. It was used for the children of God. Okay. Now let's continue here. Understanding that this child is talking about the church, it, it totally opens up this passage to be able to interpret it correctly. When you get to verse six, it says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Do you see? The child is caught to heaven. Then Israel, the woman, flees into the wilderness. Well, why does she need to flee to the wilderness? Because the tribulation is about to start. And God warned them. Jesus warned them in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation, that you need to run into the place that is prepared for you. And it says clearly that this has been a, this is a place prepared for 1,260 days, which is from the begin, the middle of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation. OK, so that is very key to understand there. Now, when we look at verse seven, OK, look at verse seven. Now, watch this with the church being in heaven now. OK, you that's a clear, clear understanding. The child was caught up to the throne. OK, so the church is in heaven. This child is in heaven. Now, Satan comes up to heaven because he has an issue with that. Verse seven, he tried to destroy, but he couldn't. So now he's coming up to heaven to point his finger at the church. Watch what he says in verse seven. It says, and war broke out in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. That is so interesting to me that Satan still has access to heaven. We see that in the book of Job. <laughs> you know, Satan had to, you know, Satan has to go to heaven. Why? Because he has to get God's permission to do the things that he wants to do on the earth, which is mind boggling to me. OK, so all the stuff that the devil is doing is only fulfilling God's ultimate purpose anyway. He's going to get the glory when he comes back. OK, so, so listen to this. Verse nine, the dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. So Satan went up to heaven. Why did he go up to heaven? Well, verse 10 shows us. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. OK, so here we see very clearly Satan went up to heaven to accuse the church. He went to point out every sin. He went to go point out all the things that we did wrong. You see, when we go up to heaven, we are going to sit at Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. That happens in heaven. OK, so Christ is going to wipe away all of our bad deeds and he is going to reward us for the good deeds. But Satan goes up to accuse us for all the sins that we've committed, for all the bad things that we've committed, for every time we were disobedient. He's going to bring up everything and he's going to accuse us. He's going to bring up the law and he's going to try to make a case for why we should not be there. Verse 11. OK, so uh, back in verse 10, they are celebrating because he's being cast down. Now, watch what happens in verse 11. And they overcame him. Who is they? The church. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb that cleansed us from all our sins. Right. And by the word of their testimony. My testimony is going to be that Jesus Christ has. My testimony when I get to heaven is not going to be my own good works, my own righteousness. My testimony is going to be that I am the righteousness of Christ and that his blood cleansed me from all of my sins, that his death has is what defeated Satan, that his life is my life, that his resurrection is my resurrection. That is going to be the word of our testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Now stop right there. I don't know how clear this chapter can be. The saints of God have been caught up to the throne. Now they are rejoicing over the defeat of Satan. Michael and his angels cast Satan back to the earth. He went up there to accuse us. He sent him back to the earth. He, remember, he tried to destroy us, destroy us. Satan knew around the time that this, that the rapture would take place, that the glorify us receiving our glorified bodies would take place. Well, it took place. We were snatched to protection and, and the throne. He followed us up there to appoint the finger and accuse. There was war. Michael defeated him and cast him back down to the earth. Then the, the saints, the brethren are celebrating in heaven. Glory to God. Satan has been cast down. We overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. Then in verse 12, it says rejoice. Who should rejoice? Oh, heavens and you who dwell in them. Who dwells in heaven? The church. We were raptured to heaven. I don't see how how much more clearer this can be. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. The ones who dwell, who dwells? The child that was caught up to the throne. OK, the body of Christ. That is who the who should rejoice here. But watch the watch the the uh, distinction here. There's a distinction. 
Those of you in heaven, it says, rejoice and you who, you all heavens, rejoice and you who dwell in them. Watch what it says now. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Uh oh. So for those who are, uh, who are still on the earth, woe to you. Why? Because you are about to suffer tribulation and persecution that this world has never seen. Now, that does not mean the church has never experienced persecution, okay? But it is what it is. The Bible shows clearly that we get caught up to the throne. And then after we get caught up to the throne, Satan goes up to heaven to accuse us. And then they, he gets cast down to the earth. And now the tribulation is about to begin. And he knows his days are numbered. He has a short time. This chapter is so clear to me and supports a, a pre-trib rapture. I don't know what else is more clear than this. OK, but I know there's a lot of you out there that disagree, <laughs> but I'm just going to continue. OK, I'm just re I'm reading the word. This is what scripture is saying. Now, watch verse 13. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who is the woman? Israel. He is going to persecute Israel. And he's going to persecute her for three and a half years. Verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So you see that there is being nourishment and protect. There is nourishment and protection taking place for Israel. But at some point when we read in the book of Daniel, the persecution is going to rise to a certain level where it's going to seem that Satan is winning the battle. And all of that will be ended at the last day when Jesus Christ returns and he puts an end to Satan's rule. OK, now verse 15 will continue. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So somehow Satan's going to have some type of control over some water. I don't know if it's a tsunami or what, but some, he's trying to send this flood after the church. I mean, excuse me, after Israel. And God is going to miraculously open up some type of hole in the earth to, for the water to flow into where the where Israel is protected. That's too amazing for me, but that's what the text says. And so that's how I reconcile that. Verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you see here, there will still be people on the earth that come to faith and will be saved. But that is very clear that prior to this time, there is a child that got caught up to the throne and is rejoicing over the victory that Satan was, his accusations did not stand and he was cast down to the earth. So here we see clearly there are saints that are rejoicing in heaven and afterwards there are saints that are here still on the earth. Oh gosh, I j that is just so clear to me. That is just so clear to me. And so what I wanna lay out here is this. It all boils down to how you interpret scripture, okay? You see, this child, it is clearly showing us a birth. And this child, in a way, is Christ, but we're talking about Christ's body, which is the church. It's not just talking about Christ the head and him alone. It is the body of Jesus Christ, who is the church? You see, there's a quick scripture I want to read to you because Paul says this oneness between Christ and the church is a great mystery. OK, Ephesians chapter six, verse 30, it says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. We are of his flesh. We are of his bones. The, the scripture is saying. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You see here, Paul makes a, a illustration of Christ in the church is just like the relationship between a husband and his wife. Why? Because the church is the bride of Christ. Okay. What did Adam say to Eve? You are bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. That's what we are as the body of Christ. We are bone of Christ's bone. We are flesh of his flesh. Now watch this. Verse 32, it says, this is a great mystery. Well, yeah. How do we fully grasp the truth that we are bone of Christ's bone and flesh of his flesh? But I speak concerning Christ and the church. We are. Our oneness to Christ is a great mystery, the Bible says, and this mystery will be revealed when we receive our glorified bodies and when we get married finally to Jesus Christ. All this happens in heaven. OK, so there is so many cases in Scripture where I see clearly that we receive our resurrected bodies and are in heaven prior to the tribulation starting. And then the tribulation saints receive their glorified bodies when Christ returns, when we return with Christ. So I see that very clearly there. And there are a lot of people that have different views and I understand that. But this is I just I just I'm, I went line upon line with this text. And I, I believe that is crystal, crystal, crystal clear. OK, so that's Revelation 12. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here. Guys, I just want to give a shout out to all of you who are my supporters. I just want to say God bless you. Thank you so much. I am just so thankful. Uh, I, uh, many of you have just put in some amazing comments that just, wow. I mean, you, you're telling me how much you're learning, how much you're growing, how much you appreciate these teachings. And guys, that is really encouraging to me. I just wanted to put that out there. Stay tuned, guys. The next video I have coming up, uh, I'm going to definitely continue with the Revelation series, but I'm about to put out a video talking about John Nelson Darby and dispensationalism. OK, it's time for me to put out a video uh, discussing these things. Uh, it's a, I believe it's a very, very important topic, and I have a very interesting perspective, perspective that I want to put out that I believe needs to be out and is very important. OK. And I'm also, guys, I have a project. Oh, I'm so excited about this project. I'm putting in the fine, uh, just tuning in, uh, excuse me, tuning up the fine pieces, I'm trying to say. I'm slipping over my words a little bit. But just putting up the finishing touches, what I want to say, with this project I'm about to launch. And I can't wait to tell you all about it, how we can partner together for the furthering of the kingdom, for the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So please stay tuned for that. I will be coming out with that video very soon. Thank you all for liking, subscribing. If you are enjoying these teachings, if you think it would benefit someone, please send it to them. Please share it with them as we continue to grow together, as we continue to learn together. So this is Cornelius Jones signing off. I love you guys in the Lord, and I will see you on the next video. Take care. Be blessed.